This video was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. Today we will be reviewing the Chanel Cruise Collection 2021 slash 2022 dedicated to the relationship, friendship between Coco Chanel and Jean Cocteau. Jean Cocteau being a very interesting playwright, author, poet, painter, artist, sketcher, drawer, and film director. So he had a strong relationship with Chanel and very fascinating. I always, you know, there's this one of these biggest myths of uh, the unity between Cocteau, between Jean Cocteau and Coco Chanel is that, and the Chanel brand is never going to tell you this, but one of the biggest stories, um, biggest alleged mysteries and uh, most beautifully poetic reasons to her double C logo is that uh, Cocteau, being the artist that he is, gifted it to her as a symbol of their friendship and unity because Coco Chanel funded and subsidized a lot of his theater pieces before he was famous, before he had any money. She would go to the theaters, say, here's the money, produce his piece, don't tell him I gave you the money. I don't want him to feel guilty or obliged or bad in any way. Jean Cocteau was gay, which, there you go, debunked the theory that she was homophobe. She was not. Cocteau gifted her the double C, allegedly, uh, stating that this is the love that he had for her and appreciation he had for her and their friendship. One C being Coco and the other one Cocteau. Coco and Cocteau together. Before we get to the fashion show review, if you haven't already, but do like my content, thumb up this video and subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. You can also push the join button next to the subscription button and become a member today. Gain access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super Dakeball spelled together there as well. Thank you so much to all my members and patrons who have already pledged. And thank you to all my co-reviewers of the fashion show who are live with me in the chats right now as we, ge as we, as we gear up to review the cruise collection because this video is being filmed live in front of a virtual audience. So, the fashion show itself, just to give you a little bit of a background before we get to the fashion show, um, I have my little cards prepared here. So, I will butcher this name in French. I do apologize ahead of time. Carrier de Lumière. Okay, that is the... Uh, they call it a place of history. And this is the setting to the fashion show. It was shot in the Carrier de Lumière. Now, let me read a, a bit of this Carrier de Lumière first. Now a major venue in the Provence. The Carrier de Lumière site is located at the foot of the village of Les Bouts de, de Provence, or Les le, le Baux, or Les Bouts de Provence. Sorry for butchering it. In the heart of the Alpilles, in a place filled with mystery, the Val d'Enfer. 2,000 years ago, the formation of stone, it is a stone formation where stone would be excavated from to build buildings and houses. Also known as the Stone of the South, Le, Le Bau, uh, sorry again for butchering the name, Le Bau stone is a slightly calcareous limestone, fine-grained and usually white or blonde in color. The area's characteristically white limestone blocks are easily worked and were used to build Glanum, the medieval village of Le Beau de Provence, and for the construction of the castle of Le Bau. The results from the compaction of calcium carbonate on calcareous sand. Marine fossils have been found in the rock. 1800, so in the 1800s, opening of the quarry at Les Grands Fonds. Industrial developments led to the construction of many buildings which required large quantities of stone in the 1800s. So Fontvielle, the neighboring village of Les Baux, benefited greatly from the growing demand for the stone at this time, as its white stone was said to be of better quality than Les Baux stone. However, the number of quarries in operation in Les Baux at this time attest to the town's increased production. One such quarry was Les Grands Fonds, known today as Les Carriers de Lumière. 
1821, a red mineral was discovered in the quarries. It was used for the extraction of, alum of aluminium and named bauxite after the name of the neighboring commune of Le Bau de Provence. Sorry again for butchering the names. In 1935, the quarry closed. Following the First World War, the demand for stone for construction purposes declined. New building materials such as steel and concrete emerged. More economical than stone, these new materials threatened the future of stone quarries. The quarry was eventually forced to close. This is the query where the fashion show is going to take place, the Chanel fashion show that we're going to review now. So I'm reading, reading to you the history of it and trying to understand how does it connect to the uh, Chanel cruise collection. In 1959, a new artistic vocation, the Carrier was the muse, were the muse, decor, inspiration, and setting for their creative works. Dante saw the site as the ideal setting for the plot of his divine comedy, La Divina Commedia, from Dante Alighieri. And it was here that uh, Gounod created his opera Mireille. In 1959, and here we get to the point, Jean Cocteau decided to film the testament of Orfe or Orpheus or Orfeo on the site. Entranced by the beauty of the place and the surrounding environment, the testament of Orpheus is a poetic escapade at the center of Cocteau's thinking between a dreamlike world and somnolence. This is what his... Um, Aesthetic is all about, always. Also in his drawings, he's like outlined drawings. It's very simplistic. I love Cocteau's drawings, by the way. So Cocteau filmed a movie in 59, in the quarry. The site was further transformed, also in 1959, through the creation of a new project inspired by the ideas of Joseph Svoboda, scenographer of the second half of the 20th century. This project was designed to enhance the space. It was decided that the huge rock walls of the quarry would form the backdrop for a sound and light show, which we are also going to see during the fashion show soon. In 2012, the culture spaces delegate delegatee of the site. The town of Beau de Provence entrusted culture spaces with the management of the quarry as part of the public service concession agreement. Named Le Carrier de Lumière, culture spaces has developed a unique and innovative concept for the site. Amiex Art and Music Immersive Experience, Le Carrier de Lumière, opened in March with the exhibition Gauguin, Van Gogh, Painters in Color, directed by Gianfranco Iannuzzi, Renato Gatto, and Massimiliano Siccardi. Every year since the opening in 2012, the Carrier de Lumière holds an immersive digital exhibition devoted to a major artist, produced by Culture Spaces and directed by Gianfranco Iannuzzi, Renato Gatto, and Massimiliano Siccardi. So then they list the exhibitions they had in 2013 with Manet, Renoir, 2014 was Klimt and Vienna, 2015 was Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, 2016 was Chagall, Midsummer Night's Dreams, 2017, The Fantastic and Wonderful World of Bosch, then we got 2019, Picasso and the Spanish Masters, Van Gogh, 2019, 2020, Salvador Dali, the Endless Enigma, and it is closed because of the lockdown, but it opened just to allow Chanel to film the fashion show and illuminate those walls that they illuminate with the paintings of the artists doing the collections. They illuminated the walls with sketches and drawings of Jean Cocteau. So we have the setting where Jean Cocteau in 1959 filmed his Orpheus movie. We have the walls utilized to illuminate, project some of his sketches and drawings. And we have that connection and friendship that Chanel had with Cocteau, that Coco Chanel back then had with Cocteau, which now is depicted in a way like the brand of Chanel is again bringing back to the memory of us consumers, the memory of Jean Cocteau by uniting their forces with the uh, foundation of Jean Cocteau, bringing back to light Jean Cocteau. So, in a way, as Coco, back in the day, secretly funded, you know, the Jean Cocteau gave money to the theaters to produce his theater pieces, today, 
it's not secret, it's official, but the brand Chanel brings back the memory of Jean Cocteau by bringing back his memory into a Chanel fashion show. So it is commendable. It is a noble gesture. But let's see how it translates visually. Okay, so let's get to the show. The texts I read to you were directly from the Carrier, uh, from the Query website. So go check out their website, by the way, fair use. And this video is taken from the Chanel website. Here you see the quarry and the birds flying. It's a huge space, okay, the stone quarry. Uh, so the video is also taken from the Chanel website, so it's fair use. The music, however, I have taken music that is copyright free. This is not the original music from the show. Now you see they're walking through the passage of these stone walls and they illuminated the stars. The projection of the stars those are Jean Cocteau drawn stars. So we got a little bit of slow motion. The first model is walking down this mystical pathway that almost looks Egyptian in many ways, doesn't it? It almost looks like an excavation site. Again, uh, Agatha Christie comes to mind with uh, Death on the Nile or Evil Under the Sun, but mostly Death on the Nile. It has a very early 20s mid-twenties vibe to it. Black and white is the word du jour, very simplistic. Virginie Via, who is the artistic director of Chanel, went for a very simple design, I want to say, <laughs> when it comes to color choices for now. Let's see how it goes on. This particular dress that just went down the runway with the V-cut, not very body compassion. Here you have some more details of Cocteau's drawings on that little mini skirt, which was I uh, here stars and squares and geometric shapes on the black mini skirt. We had black geometric shapes on white mini skirt. Now we have pants with drawings. Some of these are Cocteau inspired, some are not. Obviously the Chanel burst of stars is not Cocteau, but they're blending Cocteau design with Chanel aesthetic. We got the lion, we got a, another star, we got the star constellations, which are not intrinsically Cocteau. Now, I have to be honest with you, I do not know whose face that is on the t-shirt. They're trying to go a little bit punk rock on us, or not punk rock, just punk, which is Virginie Viard loves the 80s. She loves that whole 80s punky movement, um, the new romantics, which doesn't always suit Chanel in the right way, especially not if you're doing a tribute to Cocteau and Chanel. Like, how does that blend in? Cocteau was... Uh, there you have the stars projected. Those are drawings by Cocteau, by the way. So Cocteau was subversive and innovative in a way, and so, so was Coco Chanel, but for their time. So if they were alive today, they would be subversive for today's standards. And I don't find it very subversive to go for the punk aesthetic. Because we've seen it already, it's been done already. So how do you create innovation today? Now I know this is a cruise collection and it's supposed to be meant to escape the cold European winters by going to warm places, hence the lighter fabrics. But still, don't forget Virginie, your main topic is Cocteau and Chanel. So how are we implementing? Okay, you're shooting the exhibit, you're shooting the fashion show at a place where Cocteau in 1959 shot a movie. Here's a dove. The famous white dove of Jean Cocteau is on this crochet slash knitwear. We get to see Cocteau's dove, symbol of peace, symbol of transcendence. But how do you implement that dove within the clothing, within a collection by Chanel. It's easy to just print and stitch things that another artist made on top of other clothes. This is terrible. This face, I really, I don't know whose face this is. If they updated Chanel's face, <laughs> Coco doesn't look like Coco to me, but wow. Anyway, how, or maybe it's from the poster, maybe it's from Cocteau's movie, I don't know, but it's just so transformed that I, I, I can't tell you whose face this is. Doesn't matter. Uh, well, it matters because it ruins the experience for me, but it's there. The face is there. What can we say? So, you know, all of these drawings and all of the artistry and masterfulness of Cocteau's art, how do you put that into a Chanel collection and make it relevant, make it interesting? 
I have the feeling it's a cop-out to just go for the, oh yeah, let's print the dove, it's a symbol, let's print the stars, it's a symbol on the clothes, and, and done. Because like I have the feeling that's how far they went. This is a beautiful, breathtaking setting for this um, collection. It's breathtaking, okay? The clothes are super simple, stripped down. Actually, this dress in particular, it has, you see the doves and the stars? embroidered into the dress almost like we're going in direction haute couture almost really beautiful but this is just when you layer an artist's work on top of a designer's work but there's no real interaction you see that's why i was really pressing on that point before telling you that it is said that jean cocteau created the double c for chanel you see that's when an artist and a designer's genius merge and something beautiful is born something new is born like that double c logo is its own thing it's it has a life of its own that's when a collaboration is right this here is like saying okay we've got Chanel clothes let's put some prints of Cocteau on top of them and that's it you see what i mean it, it ends there it doesn't there's no catharsis cathartic process there's no catharsis there is no transformation it doesn't take me to a new place i'm happy that they're paying tribute and homage to one of my favorite artists which is jean cocteau and i'm thrilled to see his doves and his stars on the chanel clothing yes it's great to bring his memory back into life but how are you contributing to furthering the conversation between this historic conversation led between chanel and cocteau between coco and Cocteau. How do we how do we bring it further? And here as thus far, I have I, I don't have the impression that they are giving me something new, that they're giving me something uh, that they're showing me a new facet of the relationship between Cocteau and Chanel. Because that's what I was expecting. You're finally making even Karl Lagerfeld never dared touch the Cocteau and Coco friendship. He never went there because it's a very complex thing. So Virginie went there, okay, go there, but then how, what do I learn from this? What do I get from this that I haven't gotten before? Thus far, nothing. This is an interesting print of classic Chanel details like the camellia, probably the gardenia, there's some chains, there's some starbursts, blended in with maybe some white doves by Cocteau. So it's an interesting pattern very flashy, you know, and this is the seasonal print. It's the AOP, the all over print of the season. They have one every season. So if you're into black and white, sketchy type of like a sketch type of look and you love flashing the logo, then, you know, that's for you. But again, it doesn't further our conversation and, and the relationship between Coco and Cocteau. These flowy gowns and dresses and mumus uh, seem super comfortable, super fresh. Interesting that uh, Bruno Pavlovsky, the you know head of Chanel, complained about Yves Saint Laurent. Yes, he officially complained about Yves Saint Laurent copying their tweeds, and he was very disappointed by it. Interesting that he said that, and then just a couple of days after that, we see these Yves Saint Laurent inspired mumus on the Chanel runway. So I'm like, you're complaining about Yves Saint Laurent copying Chanel, but then Chanel is letting Yves Saint Laurent styled mumus uh, run down the runway, like 70s inspired. So I'm like, you know, don't, don't preach if you can't, you know, be on the beach. <laughs> Just saying, the crochet is always beautiful. Now crochet is something that Chanel actually utilized from time to time. Not as much as, you know, we're used to seeing from Dolce Gabbana in the 90s, but it's beautiful when done well. I do believe that Chanel would, would do it well. I would need to touch the fabrics to see them, to actually give a verdict on these knits slash crochets. Could be something new for Chanel because they haven't done it in a long while. To this extent, like almost every piece in this segment of the runway has that crocheted bit, kind of like capes and little bolero style things. Why not? I like I like a good crochet that reveals a little bit of skin and creates a shading effect on, on the body. I'm all for that. But again, you know, everything is in black and white, maybe to homage the fact that the Orfeus movie by Cocteau was shot in black and white. So they look like characters that could have been that could have come out of the movie. 
but that's not enough for me. You can't just do black and white and I mean, we also have some lilac colors in there as well, but you can't just do black and white and say, yeah, that's an homage to cook. Like it's a bit too simplistic and a little bit lazy. A bit more research could have been done, you know, a bit more. It's a beautiful collection. You see it all together. Look, it's all like the same color palette, easy, simple stripped down to the core very coco chanel so virginie is doing chanel justice here she, she's doing coco just there she is virginie also dressed in black she's doing coco justice she's just not doing cocteau justice they're throwing the white doves into the air because the white dove is the symbol that cocteau uses a lot so that's a beautiful gesture for peace and yada yada but that's the end of the show with the Jean Cocteau committee, with special thanks to the Jean Cocteau committee, as Chanel says. So there was a contribution. Obviously, they're bringing back the memory of Cocteau. So this is the this is the show, you guys. This is the show. <laughs> what can I tell you? This is the show. I think from a Coco-esque point of view, some of the pieces are interesting, simple. If you got the budget for it, you're going to have some solid conservative looking outfit for your cruise collection. That's it. It ends there. It doesn't push the boundaries further. It doesn't teach us anything new that we haven't known. It might spark in some of y'all who might, maybe don't know who Jean Cocteau is, and then this might spark an interest for you to get to know more about Jean Cocteau, to read about Jean Cocteau. Jean Cocteau, uh, one, of his, one of my favorite short theater pieces that he wrote is called The Human Voice. And The Human Voice, I am obsessed with The Human Voice for several reasons. Now, if you're going to talk about Cocteau, when he did The Human Voice, Chanel was still alive. I'm sure she went to the theater to see it. Now, this is something that I would have started from this point if I were to make a Chanel Cocteau collection, because The Human Voice is a story about this woman. It's all in her bedroom. And she's desperate. Her man is not calling her. He's leaving her. She knows that he's with another woman, but she's still hopeful that he's going to come back to her. And she hasn't been out of bed for days. Uh, her windows are closed, shut. There's no light filtering through. She's a mess. And she's living for that phone to ring. This was way before smartphones. So it's a real phone, you know, the one, the twirly phone. <laughs> and when it rings, she calls, she calls, she's crying all the time. And it's this constant... It's the human voice. It's, it's a monologue. It's just her talking to him, begging him, begging him. She's reducing herself. She's stripping herself of any dignity she had left for an ounce of love in return from him. That's the power of Jean Cocteau. Fellini portrayed Anna Magnani, my favorite actress of all time, even though she's passed away, Anna Magnani is still at the top. There's not nobody on top of Anna Magnani for me. She portrayed the female character in the monologue in The Human Voice. Fellini filmed her for a, a series called Amore, Love. Check that out. She is incredible. That's Cocteau at his best. Pedro Almodovar then, in the 80s, uh, one of my favorite living directors, uh, implemented the human voice in a little short sketch inside of his bigger movie called The Law of Desire. In The Law of Desire, one of his characters acts out a scene of the human voice. It's like a theater piece within a movie. Pedro likes to do that, to layer stuff. And then, of course, Pedro Modovar went further and took the entire text of the human voice. And just this year, or actually last year, but it hasn't been released everywhere in the world yet, released his first short film, in English, main actress Tilda Swinton, and it's called The Human Voice. So again, Cocteau is also a big a reference for Pedro Almodovar, also very important for him, also very important for Fellini. A lot of people have been inspired by Cocteau, justly so, because Cocteau is, is just that incredible. So we also have Rainer Werner Fassbinder, who his last movie before he passed away was called Querelle. Querelle. Um, now, we have Gené. It's, it's a different novel, but um, Cocteau, the style and aesthetic of Cocteau's desire is also portrayed, through, because also Jean Gené is also quite inspired by Cocteau. So, I could talk about Cocteau forever, right? So, when I see a collection like this, that just doesn't deliver 
a new conversation, doesn't deliver anything new to the table, I go like, oh, what a missed opportunity. You have all that money, you have all those funds, you have all those possibilities, and you have that huge extra added bonus, which is decades long friendship between Coco and Cocteau. And this is all you can come up with? Quite disappointing, Chanel. Take Cocteau out of the equation, the pieces on their own. Some of them are from a conservative standpoint. Nice, they're lovely dresses. But that's it. Let me get to your comments. Jacob, my neighborhood local movie theater was also designed by Jean Cocteau. It is a tiny theater full of history, says MK. Oh, I would love to see it. Jesus says, Cha, that collection almost put me to sleep. Thanks, Chanel, for the slight sedation. Mr. Phillips says, Somehow it felt as if a few designers were working on this collection and they had to somehow combine punk into Jean Cocteau. I know, it's kind of... Mm. And that's because Virginie, she's all about that stuff. So, Oh, and ELTS, keep it black and white so it's like cohesive. MK says, some prints were also very reminiscent of Castel Bajac. So, MK, what you think are prints are not actually prints. They were, they were knitted on the fabrics, and they are not reminiscent of Castel Bajac because Cocteau comes before Castel Bajac. So, all of those patterns and prints, the star, the, the white dove, those are exact drawings and sketches of Jean Cocteau from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s, so 50s. And so they just took them and put them onto clothes. So you could say Castel Bajac in many ways is inspired by Cocteau. So Castel Bajac's many designs and references work in a way that reference Cocteau. So in this respect, I, we cannot say that this Chanel collection is reminiscent of Castel Bajac, it's, it, because it's not. It's, it's Cocteau. It's quintessentially Cocteau. All of the drawings and all of the kind of sketches that were there were taken from the Cocteau archives. It just so happens that Castel Bajac looks similar to Cocteau, not the other way around. Jack says they didn't really create anything. No, not really. Collection was fine, but completely unnecessary. And this is also an interesting point because it brings me to the point of saying it's not necessary because we were talking about sustainability and Chanel is pushing this whole concept of sustainability, of trying to be more sustainable. And in fact, let me tell you something about this collection that Bruno Pavlovsky said um, in an interview. They're trying to be more sustainable. And I keep saying this, Okay, they're trying to be more sustainable, they're recycling materials, but if you really want to be sustainable, Boo, don't make 10 collections a year or 9 collections a year. Two are enough. Winter, summer. You don't need 10 collections. So as long as you don't cut the amount of collections you're making every year, don't try to sell me that crap about being sustainable, because you're not. Otherwise, you wouldn't be overproducing. But anyway, let's listen to the boss himself, uh, Mr. Pavlovsky, talk about um the sustainability right Chanel is hoping that its growing efforts to produce sustainable fabrics will further seduce its luxury clientele. The Cruise Collection, which we have just seen, features four eco-friendly tweeds, the first of their kind, made by Lesage, with manufacturers Act 3, Denis and Phil and Vimar, and the Italian yarn maker that Chanel acquired last year, oh, then it's Vimar. Uh, the Global Organic Textile Standard is a textile production certification that limits the use of toxic bleaches, dyes, and other chemical um, inputs during the production process of textiles. The Global Recycled Standard sets requirements for third-party certification of recycled content and chain of custody. GOTS certifies that the materials come from organic farming with dignified working conditions and respect for the environment throughout the value chain. GRS guarantees a minimum of 20% recycled fiber composition in the fabrics along with responsible social and environmental practices, Chanel said in a statement. Opening a tweed swatch card that detailed the composition of nine separate threads, Pavlovsky said Chanel was requiring not just its internal manufacturers to adapt, but also its, ex its external suppliers. We have initiated a transformation at the heart of the brand in order to be able to claim 
to offer products that are not only the most sophisticated, but also made with materials that are produced in the most sustainable way possible, he said. I hope that eventually a great majority of our fabrics will meet these new criteria. Interview uh, with Pavlovsky for WWD. From, I don't know from when, from when is this? Me do not know. From a couple of days ago. So I just read an ext extract from that um, interview so you can see that he's actually stating that they're working towards a sustainable thing. As of now, some of their fibers and tweeds are 20% resource or sustainable, blah, blah, blah. Sure, it seems like they're working towards something, but it's not enough. It's far from enough. And the biggest thing you have to do, Chanel, if you really want to be sustainable and move the bar, is stop making 9 to 10 collections a year. There's no going around. You can't say, I'm going to keep making 10 collections a year, but the materials are sustainable. No, you're overproducing. And that in itself defies the logic of sustainability. It's like math for morons. Come on, who are you trying to trick here? Collection was fine, but completely necessary, says Jack Dean. Nancy Sinatra collection, a candy fluff says. Uh, well, Nancy Sinatra was a huge fan of Chanel in the 60s, at least. Happy Days says, boring. Take by... Oh, why the fishnet stockings? Because they wanted to make it more edgy, I guess. Jacob, I thought the double C logo was inspired by the convent. Okay, MK. I thought the double C logo was inspired by the convent in which Coco spent several years during her adolescence. She created the logo in memory of stained glasses pattern in Obazine. MK, you did not think that. That is what Chanel brand marketing wants you to think. They've manipulated you to think that because they want you to think that. That is what Chanel is going to tell you. That the double C's come from Obas... That's what brand mark. That's how powerful it was. The entire phrasing of your sentence... You never mentioned that Chanel... That the brand said that to you. They, they manipulated you into believing that that thought came from you. That's how powerful brand marketing is. Look at yours. Let me read your sentence again. You said, Jacob, I thought the double C logo was inspired by the convent in which she spent several years during her adolescence. She created the logo in memory of stained glasses pattern in Obazine. Okay. What you should have said, let me, let me say how, the, if the matrix doesn't mess with your mind, this is what you should have said. Jacob, Chanel, wants us to believe that the double C logo was inspired by the convent in which she spent several years during her adolescence. Chanel the brand also states that she created the logo in memory of stained glasses pattern in Obazine. Are we to believe that? That's how the comment should have been. You understand? Um, I do like the crochet cape, says Mrs. Blue. Jack says, these aren't go-go -go boots. They're slightly adjusted and modded with the Chanel slips. Yeah. Mr. Phillips says, when I first watched the show, I got some Italian vibes from the show for some reason, not quite as elegant for the Chanel brand. There is a little bit of Dolce Gabbana going on there too, with the crochet in particular, very Sicilian. These pieces are gorgeous, says Anna. Jack says, some of the flow beach uh, dresses would be great for different body types. I agree. Caleb says, on that pesky face, the late Stella Tennant's uh, patrician punk attitude inspired... Uh, the lip piercing jewelry, as did Ines and Vindu's photographs of the model Lola in Chanel's apartment. Okay, wait, hold on, stop here. Let me not move the chat. On that pesky face. So, is that Stella Tennant's face? Stella, really? I didn't recognize her. So that's late. Okay, so they want to commemorate Stella Tennant, who just passed away recently. So, the late Stella Tennant... Um, Patrician punk attitude inspired the lip piercing jewelry, as did Ines and Windu's photographs of the model Lola and Chanel's apartment. Yeah, but that's all flaky. That's all flaky. Then then do the punky thing, then make a tribute to Stella Tennant, but then don't put Jean Cocteau into that. Uh, don't put Cocteau into that. What does Cocteau have to do with that? Nothing. Seems a bit like a gift shop at a museum. Uh, yeah, some pieces do have a little bit of that. Gold wedges? I'm going to throw up, says Mr. Philip. Fabulous. Candy Fluff says, Gah, no Muppet fur. 
<laughs> no. Jack says, ew, the ostrich feather skirt with badly fitting top. Was that ostrich, though? The feathers seemed bigger. Maybe it was ostrich or marabou. Drax says, Rick Owens must be kicking himself that he didn't use this location. Yeah, right? It is very Rick Owens. Maybe he did in the past. I don't know. Mr. Philip Havis says, beautiful scenery, beautiful concept. Some very nice classic clean lines, but very incohesive, chaotic, dare I say, ugly designs, too. Ajam says, this collection is already a bit boring. Getting a bit bad Dior vibes here, says Aisha. I like the, the white, uh, the wide leg pants, says Jack. And uh, Mr. Philip does not like the jeans. Helena says, oh no, Candy Fluff says, go-go boots, a kind of ish, go-go ish. Maybe Coco got a facelift. I mean, if what Caleb says, you know, if that's Stella Tennant, great, more power to her. I'm happy that they homaged her. But again, then leave Cocteau out of it. Oh God, the hair, no, says Jack. The face looks like Virginie's face from the portrait Karl Lagerfeld took of her for the Petit Veste Noir or the La Petit Robe Noir book. Ah, so yeah, as I said in my review, it could be Virginie, but if it's Stella Tennant, it's, I don't know, you guys. It doesn't seem like a cruise collection. Hmm. Well, oh, here, the CC Spy. Hey, Laura, sweetie. Chanel copying indie designers like Mariam Nasir Zadeh with the gold mules. Oh, no, wait, I'm mixing up. Sorry, because the chat keeps moving instead of standing still. I prefer that the logo was... Sorry, so again, the CC Spy. I prefer that the logo was a gift from Cocteau, much more meaningful. Yes, I agree. Now, Paris Amaro says, Chanel copying indie designers like uh, Mariam Nasir Zadeh with the gold mules. And then Robert says, I fell asleep during the runway. Did I miss something? Oh my God. Okay, you guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. This was the review of the Chanel 2021 slash 2022 cruise show. I am wearing Chanel Cruise, by the way. This is Lagerfeld, Carl Lagerfeld's last cruise collection dedicated to, you know, when they launched the Lazoo range. So we got all of their traveling spots of Chanel uh, where she opened her boutiques. Very cruise-like, Biarritz, Venice, and Deauville. So we got them also on the back here. And uh, may you rest in peace, Carl. We love you. I also like what Vision Evia is doing ultimately. It's just that she still needs some time to take charge. I have the feeling that people at Chanel are still used to telling her what to do when she was under Carl. And I think she's still not stepping it up to becoming the boss. And I think that's the problem here. She needs more. She needs to dictate more and get her message through and not let other people blend in all their bullshit ideas in between. The more people cook a soup, the worse the soup gets. Thumb up this video if you liked it. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And let me know what you thought about this show in the comment section down below. Push the join button next to the subscription button. Become a member today and gain access to extra perks. Join me on Patreon, Super Deco Ball Spelled Together, to gain access to extra perks there as well, such as videos that uh, don't come to YouTube at all, but stay exclusive to members and patrons, and your name listed here in the scrolling bar at the end of every video as co-producer of The Fashion Bunker, just like at the end of every good movie where the credits roll and showcase all the wonderful people who partook in the magic that is The Fashion Bunker. I think Virginie Via needs to work. Oh, you can follow me. We're talking about Chanel. Follow me on my Instagram channel's profiles. One is called Super Deco Ball Spelled Together. The other two are Chanel related. One is dedicated to my Chanel collection called Coco Chanel is in my house, all spelled together. The other one is called Coco Chanel Privé, all spelled together, dedicated to the life of Coco Chanel. Virginie Via is an interesting little creature. I like her, but she needs to step it up a notch, you know, be a bit more peppery. Um, Robert says, all I wanted to say is that this collection is lame. Letty says, again, we continue with the theme of breathtaking landscapes, but lukewarm collection of clothes, and the theme was not on point. They missed an opportunity to create something magical. Yeah. Jack says, Paris Amaro, uh, go, go boots were a thing decades before Zade. I didn't want to say it, Jack. You said it. Thank you for saying it. Caleb says, uh, where can we find more information on the interlocking seas uh, with Cocteau? I can't find anything of it online for my basic search. Because basic search won't get you nowhere. I have a library of 100 books on Chanel. So in some of them, that it's, it's stated, it's noted. But on the internet, you're only going to find the most superficial content that you can on Coco Chanel. Because that's how the world we live in is. 
that's just how it is. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Mwah.